and now we can get started. A last tribute to the Lord's messenger. Throughout his leadership of the Hutchinson Theological Seminary, M. L. Andreasen bore in mind the counsels of the testimonies, which he would translate into Danish while preaching, and which he followed as he understood them in the school program. Believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper, was amply borne out in the whole work-study program at the seminary. Not everyone who had had the opportunity to know both Ellen White and her writings profited it by the acquaintance. A certain minister who knew Sister White to be an unassuming, modest, kind-hearted, noble woman, and who had been in their, the White family time and time again, sometimes weeks at a time, published a book entitled, Seventh-day Adventism renounced seven years before M.L. became an Adventist. In his book, the author utterly reversed his assessment of Ellen White's character and work. The fourth and last time D.M. Kenwright had been reconciled to the church before his final departure, he had admitted, quote, the real trouble lies close to home, in a proud, unconverted heart, a lack of real humility, and an unwillingness to submit to God's way of finding the truth. When Brethren Butler, White, Andrews, Haskell, or others have said something that would that wounded my feelings, I have let that destroy my confidence in the truth going on ml had never met this man whose writings have been a discouragement to many seekers for truth during the years their paths crossed under unusual circumstances on july 16 1915 ellen white went to her rest in her elms haven home where M.L. had visited her a few years before. The funeral was held in Battle Creek. M.L. was present. He saw the sanitarium's palms, ferns, and lilies that covered the platform of the great tabernacle where James and Ellen White had spoken so many times. He admired the symbolic floral pieces representing a broken wheel, a broken column, and an open Bible with the words, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. M.L. was seated near the, the, the um, casket, as he had cho been chosen to be one of the guards of honor who, would, who were there to serve to at one time, one at the head, the other at the foot. Besides M.L., there were L.H. Christian from Chicago, C.S. Longacre from the General Conference, Religious Liberty Department, and pastors from Grand Rapids, Indianapolis, and Chicago, completing the six. For two hours, more than 4,000 persons had been filing by, taking a last look, paying their last respects. M.L. had especially noticed two aged brothers, one an Adventist, the other not. Both had appeared to be deeply moved. When M.L.'s turn came to take his position on guard, he noticed that the two brothers were still standing back at their pew. Suddenly, one of them turned to the other and whispered something, then the two men made their way to the aisle and again joined the throng that was still moving toward the front. When they arrived, the old former Adventist leader rested his hand upon the side of the casket and with tears rolling down his cheeks said brokenly, This was a noble Christian woman. His words were, 
there is a noble Christian woman gone. D. M. Kenwright had once again spoken truly. M. L. heard him. Eighteen years later, when president of Union College, Andreasen wrote, I was one of the guards of honor when the body of Mrs. E. G. White lay in state at the tab in the tabernacle in Battle Creek, Michigan, and was on duty at the time Mr. Canwright approached the casket. I heard the above words uttered by D. M. Canwright and testify to their correctness. Next chapter. In 1918, M. L. left Hutchinson for Union College. At the camp meeting in Minnesota in 1918, Professor H. A. Morrison, the president of Union College, seemed to be somewhat interested in me. This is Andreasen speaking. He circled me several times and sized me up from all angles. At last he approached me and asked whether I would be interested in coming to Union College to teach Bible and history. I was, but I had no degree. However, in looking over my credits, it was found that I had more than I needed for a degree. Perhaps they could give me a degree outright, a little out of the ordinary, I know. I did not want this, but suggested that I go down to the University of Nebraska in Lincoln and see what they would do. They would do nothing. In fact, they took the heart out of me as they rejected most of my credits and left me with only a year and a half of acceptable credits, which meant that I had two and one half years to make up to get my bachelor's. I didn't feel so good, but having put my hand to the plow, I enrolled then and there. The work was easy for me, for I had already done it in other places. In fact, I had taught much of what I was now going over again. So, in less than two years, I finished the requirements, graduated, and received my B.A., all the time teaching full classes at Union College. Years later, a colleague explained what M.L. was facing in his teaching. As head of the Bible department at Union, Andreasen succeeded Camden Lacey. Elder Lacey was an Englishman. He was a good student of the Bible and had quite a command for English. For Andreasen to succeed him with his Scandinavian accent and rather unconventional way of approaching the Bible was quite an undertaking. A number of the faculty expressed surprise that he was able to command the respect of the students following Elder Lacey. A student of those days recalls, the first time I saw him was at the Kansas camp meeting at the time he came to Union. I was sitting in the tent during the young people's meeting one afternoon when the ministers went on the platform. With them, this man dressed in a wrinkled, light gray suit. He had a very distinct walk. He called it a waddle. I mistook him for a new convert in our home church. Oh my, how did he happen to wander up there with the ministers? I worried about it until he got up to speak. Then I promptly forgot all about his suit and how he walked. He really had a marvelous message. Later I took Bible doctrines from him. I'm sure I got more from that Bible class than any other because he was a master teacher and knew his Bible. He took a personal interest in his students. One day I got a message that a friend of mine had died. I was pretty downcast. When class was dismissed, he said, I'd like to see you for a moment. Something's bothering you. Is there anything I can do to help? I really appreciated that. 
He invited as many of the class as wanted to to come to his home to see his library. He had a number of early books, first editions. He had several autographed by Mrs. White. M.L. took an interest in the welfare of all the students. As the head of a committee, he went before the college board to request a gymnasium and swimming pool. The board proceeded to work out financial arrangements, and the students launched a campaign to raise their quota. Soon the college's team of horses began to plow and scrape out the hole for the swimming pool. The boys pledged 3,000 hours of free labor. One teacher surveyed the project, and M.L. took charge of the construction. Students and teachers donned working clothes and worked as though in a race against time. Once a big crew of boys worked all night, mixing concrete for the walls of the pool. At midnight, the matron and a group of girls served sandwiches and hot cocoa. When the structure was well along, the girls donned carpenter's aprons and nailed the rough flooring. The building was open for use in the early part of 1920-21, for the school year. For exercise, M.L. showed a decided preference for handball, a very strenuous game that separates the men from the boys. And if you hear a background of grumbling like it's the dog outside, but if she comes in, she'll start barking because there are deer out there too. So just ignore it, please. All right. For exercise, he showed an interest in handball, a very strenuous game that separates the men from the boys. Two men bat a ball against three walls, providing much more of a workout than volleyball. M.L. used to go to the YMCA to play. One year, he almost won against the Nebraska state champion. When he went to play handball, M.L. would take along a clean pair of socks to put on after he took his shower, once he went from handball to prayer meeting. During the service, he put his hand into his pocket to take out a handkerchief, and it turned to be a sock. M.L. needed this vigorous exercise to compensate for the heavy a study program. But what about the reaction to his studying? I am sure President Morrison knew what I was doing, but officially he knew nothing. But Washington knew I was a lawbreaker. Against the plain law, I had gone to the university. What could be done? The crisis came when I continued to work on my master's degree. I had not asked permission of the college president to go to school, for I knew he would have to forbid me. But Washington had suspicions and sent Professor Howell to find out what was going on. I had nothing to hide, so I told him the whole story, and he faithfully reported to Washington. Then Elder Daniels himself came out. He arrived at College View at an inconvenient time. I had a class at the university half an hour after chapel was dismissed at Union. If I could get away from chapel in time to catch the half-hour half car, I would make my class in time. It was a close connection, but most of the time I made it. The day Elder Daniels arrived, I was just running to catch the car. I did not see him before he called me. I answered that I had to make a class at the university, but that I would see him later. I can still see him standing on the street, helpless, while I was on the steps of the car, rushing away. I don't think he loved me very much at that particular time. The car had gone several blocks before it dawned on me what an unkind and discourteous thing I had done. <clears throat> Should I get off and run back? 
but it would be a long way and he would be gone by that time, so I stayed on the car. But I did not get much good out of my class that day. When I saw Elder Daniels later in the day, I made due apologies, but it was too late. I had committed Lee's majesty, and I knew it, and the elder was not in the mood to forgive just then. Knowing I was guilty, I said nothing and was duly repentant, and I was indeed sorry. It took some years before a close friendship was restored. As it turned out, father and elder daughter both received their M.A. degree on the same day, August 13, 1922. Meanwhile, difficulties had arisen at Union. M.L. explains that there was a situation at the college that made a distinct cleavage between large, a large number of the faculty and the board. He told Annie, I'm on the green carpet. Anything can happen. What shall we do if we are forced to take a stand? Take your stand and let the consequences be what they may, was her response. At the end of the school year, some ten faculty members left Union with the unanimous consent of the board. M.L. was one of those who resigned, but an arrangement was made by which most of them, including M.L., transferred to Washington Missionary College in Tacoma Park, Maryland. M.L. stayed there for two years. Teaching at Washington Missionary College did not afford M.L. the freedom he had enjoyed at Union. He was unhappy in his Bible classes because he felt obliged to teach it the way they teach it here. He asked for a class in American history, the field in which he had earned his master's. In that class, he could be himself. But the theological bind continued. At the Colorado Springs Teachers' Convention, he called out a colleague and confided, My conscience won't permit me to teach Bible any longer. Although H.L. Morrison, who was now president of Washington Missionary College, and the students were back of him, Andreasen was determined to leave. In later years, one of his young women students summed up her concept of Andreasen's approach to the study of truth. He was honest, absolutely honest, and he felt that when you did research, you should not start from any preconceived ideas that truth never had to be defended from a previous bias. Truth is the truth. If you are able to clear your mind so you can pursue a research project, seeing other angles besides those you are looking for, if in this process you find some things that seem to go against what you thought was truth, just keep hunting some more and it will come out all right. That was M.L.'s approach. He used the approach even in informal situations. He liked the students to think things through, to arrive at a conclusion by themselves. Then he would show them how a Bible text or a spirit of prophecy quotation had said so all along. He loved to sit down with a small group and talk about heaven, what it meant, what it would be like. Put your mind to the stretch, he would say. The students would talk with their imaginations running riot. Before it was through, M.L. would quote a little verse to clinch it. We'll hear the song Paul and Silas sang that shook the jail down. We'll hear the song of Moses, the song of Miriam, but then we'll hear God sing. He will joy over thee with singing. Who will sing a duet with God? Then he'd go to his files and draw a card that would add to the thought. 
M. L. was willing that others should receive credit. Once a friend of his gave a Sabbath school review. When M. L. got up to proceed with the lesson study, he said, I don't know whether you know it or not, but you just heard something. While teaching in Washington, that's Washington, D.C., M. L. had his appendix removed. In one of the books he tells of his experience, upon awaking from the anesthetic. It was Christmas Eve. I was awakening after an operation. I was conscious for just a moment and then sank back into unconsciousness again. But in that moment, I heard the angels sing, Silent Night, Holy Night. These angels were the nurses of the institution who were passing through the halls singing this beautiful Christmas carol that has become the favorite in so many lands. Their voices were sweet and soft, and in my half-conscious state, I barely thought I was in heaven. When I came back to consciousness again, this time for a little longer, I still heard the singing. I was alone in the room, all was peaceful, and the singing came nearer and nearer. Through misty eyes, I saw white-clad clad figures passing in the hall and heard the song of the angels gradually receding. Now I knew I was in heaven. All my trials were over, all was well with my soul, and in sweet content. Meant, I sank back on the pillows and was again in the land of forgetfulness. Never shall I forget the joy and the peace that pervaded my whole being as I rested in the sweet consul consciousness of sins forgiven and salvation assured. The third time I awoke, a nurse was bending over me and quietly asking how I was feeling feeling? What had happened to me? <clears throat> Was I not in heaven? She felt the bandage. The bandage? Did I have a bandage on? <clears throat> I felt it, and it was there. I was not in heaven. I was in a hospital. The disappointment is not easily described. As head of the Bible Department at Union College and of the Theology Department at Washington Missionary College, Andreas encountered his students by scores. Then one day he was given an opportunity to count his students by thousands. He was asked to prepare a series of lessons for the world's greatest university, Sabbath School. He thrilled at the challenge to be sure he would not be able to see his students and they would not even know his name, but he could help each of them to think things through as all around the world they studied. The Christian Life. That's the title. By the time the lessons were in use during the fourth quarter, 1924, M. L. had already begun his work of as president of the Minnesota Conference. And now we start the chapter entitled The Minnesota Conference. Though I was asked to connect with the General Conference Sabbath School Department and also was offered the presidency of an established college, I declined and accepted a call to be president of the Minnesota Conference. I hoped that there... I would be able to attend the University of Minnesota and go on with my schoolwork. I would have more freedom, but it did not turn out that way. I found that I could not do my work as president and also go to school. ML's daughter, Vesta, comments, When Father accepted the Minnesota Conference presidency in 1924, he said he'd take it but he wouldn't sit in the office all day long. When he got his work done, he'd take off, maybe go home to write, 
or to the library to study. He was not going to waste a whole day in the office. He never did just one thing. If nothing else, he was writing. When he traveled around in Minnesota, he took a typewriter with him in the car to type out his sermons or to write. Though he was not mechanically inclined, he made a typing table that could have been patented. M.L. considered that an important part of his work consisted in calling on members in their homes as well as visiting the churches. He liked to have Annie accompany him on his visits whenever possible. He used to say, Mother, we have to go on a trip today. Can you be ready in 15 minutes? He knew she could be. Most of the people in Minnesota, including Seventh-day Adventists, lived on farms in the 1920s. To leave the comforts of the city and visit the people in the country was like taking a step back into the 19th century. When M.L. and Annie would arrive at a church elder's home on Friday afternoon, they would probably find the children pumping water to fill the buckets lined up by the kitchen door. Earlier in the day, they had poured kerosene into the lamps and lanterns and wiped the soot out of the lamp chimneys. In their room, M.L. and Annie would find a big pitcher of water and a wash basin, both of thick chinaware. With these, they would freshen up after their ride through the clouds of dust that rose from the dirt roads. And dirt they were, especially the side roads. Only one-tenth of the state highways were paved in 1924. One-fifth did not even have gravel surface. During the four or five months that snow was on the ground, farmers could leave home only by horse-drawn sleigh. The children often walked two or three or more miles to country school. Although after 1928 the main highways were snow-plowed, it was much later before county and side roads were kept open to automobiles. Every April, when the snow and frost were thawing out of the ground, the dirt roads could become bottomless mud holes. The remaining months, every time it rained, the roads would fill with puddles and ruts. Only in the 1930s were most roads graded and gravel surfaced, making them all weather. As M.L. and Annie made their visits to the churches, they would often find the roads blocked by a sign saying, Detour, the first word some country children learned to read. At their next year's visit, they would find a former dirt road graveled and perhaps tarred. Other stretches they could now ride on, on another stretch they could now ride on banked, short-cut curves, replacing some of the 1,379 unnecessarily sharp turns that had plagued state highways. Again, they were grateful to see a series of dangerous grade crossings eliminated by the new highways remaining on one side of the railroad track. The church members soon discovered that the Andreasons were easy to entertain. Nothing pleased them more than to be treated like home folks. They were delighted that they could eat from the plates set on the oilcloth without the luxury of a tablecloth. If M.L. asked for a drink of water, it pleased him if he was told where he could find it. One time, when he was visiting alone, the family he was to stay with had just moved, and the hostess was apologizing. What do you mean, he asked. We're eating off the back of the stove, aren't we? If there were plenty of beans to eat, M.L. was happy. M.L. and Annie were first able to ride on pavement between their home in St. Paul and the campground during their fifth camp meeting season at Anoka. 
by the time ML's tenure in Minnesota ended in 1931, three-fourths of the state's 7,000 miles of highways were dust-free and 1,700 miles were not. A woman whose home the Andreasens visited on several occasions has provided personality pictures. He had an unusual ability to notice all the children in a family. Before long, he would either be playing a game with them or doing something else very attractive to their thinking. Whenever we knew he was coming, the children would be just as delighted as we were. On one occasion when they came, we had a new baby girl with large brown eyes. The Andreasens hadn't seen her before. As they walked in, Elder Andreasen said, I know her eyes are blue. No, they aren't. They're brown, I replied. He took her sister by the hand and the, went excuse me, over to the crib. The baby was looking up with big brown eyes. He looked at her and said, Well, the whites are blue and walked off. One time, there was a knock at the back door. Elder Andreasen was there. Where's Mrs. Andreasen, I asked. Well, my car won't go. It stopped about four blocks away. I've been there for about half an hour trying to make it go. I came thinking maybe Will would drive down there, pick up Mother, and bring her to the house. In just a few minutes, both cars came. Elder Andreasen walked into my kitchen. I don't think Will's very considerate. What do you mean, I asked. Well, I think he could have at least made it appear difficult to get started. In 1929, a young ministerial graduate was called to be the youth leader in the Minnesota Conference. His wife tells of their first year. We saw how generous Elder Andreasen was with his home. If someone came to town and wanted to stay overnight, or some needy person appeared. When he first called us to Minnesota, we lived with them for possibly a year. There was never one iota of friction. We had to use all the rooms together except the bedrooms. We were just married. The credit goes to Mrs. A. Elder Andreasen's mother was living with us. She was such an energetic woman that Mrs. A. had a terrific time keeping her occupied. She wanted to go out and sweep and dig. Mrs. A. had to be diplomatic in her treatment. The grandma liked to sew, so Mrs. A. would buy her yards and yards of material and tell her what to make. By afternoon, it would be all used up. We had our first Christmas tree at A's after we were married. Christmas trees were sort of frowned upon in the denomination. We weren't brought up Adventist, and we always had a tree in our homes. We hesitated to ask Elder Andreasen, but there was no question about it. We should have it. It was a little tree on the dining table. We, he enjoyed it with its balls and tinsels, no candles. One day, one of the very old-fashioned, strict ministers came to A's house during Christmas season. We could see there might be a little reflection on the A's because of the tree. But the visiting elder had his little conference with the president and never said a word about the tree. Mrs. A. was an immaculate housekeeper and a good, plain cook. Occasionally, she made little delicacies. People asked for her recipe for filled cookies. Once, over a period of weeks, M. L. took a former student around to visit the churches and talk about his mission experience in China. Each Friday, they would come to get the wife and the two small boys to be with them at some church on Sabbath. During the week, the family stayed with Annie. M.L. said, 
If you can get along with mother, you can stay forever. <laughs> the missionary wife commented, Mother was a doll, so unassuming and still so queenly. She was very quiet and sincere, tended her own business, never gossiped. She loved people. While M.L. was alert to have even a missionary on furlough make his contribution, he also took an interest in the health of the ministers under his charge. Once, he said, Elder Smith, you should take Monday off every week. As conference president, I shouldn't tell you, but I am telling you. In later years, another former student was pastoring a big church, speaking on the radio five days a week. One day, M.L. said to him, You've got to slow down. Then he added humorously, If you don't, I'll officiate at the, ma at the marriage of your widow. <laughs> M.L. was fond of little children. One worker's family was living in a home about a mile from A's when their son was born. He was a premature baby, and M.L. wanted to see him. He went to the house and took the baby home with him, his first outing after coming home from the hospital. As that son grew, he loved to have Uncle Andy visit the family. A minister tells how that when a small boy, he didn't get to go to the camp meeting very often, so it was a rare treat when he did. At camp meeting, he enjoyed listening to M.L. because he spoke very distinctly in a measured way that the boy could understand. However, on one particular morning, M.L. was speaking about Abraham, Tara, and Lot, and how they left Ur of the Chaldees and were on their way to a place they didn't know. M.L. talked about the relationships between the different patriarchs and the overlapping of their great age, the philosophy and teaching that they shared with generation after generation. From the way he talked about Terah, the boys supposed there was much more in the Bible about him than there actually was. When M.L. referred to Abraham's stop in Haran, he said several times that Terah died in Hian, omitting the R. The boy, who had never heard a New Yorker talk before, thought, How can Elder Andreasen say that Terah died in heaven when the Bible says no one is going to die in heaven? He poked his mother, inquiring what M.L. was expounding. She smiled just a little. She whispered, Heron, and that was enough. M.L. liked to visit with his ministers individually while they were working together, pitching tents for camp meeting. A preacher who was just then beginning his ministry relates, <coughs> He enjoyed catching a young worker by surprise by asking a question that might not be too easy to answer right away. He came to me and asked, How would you define in one word soul? I thought a moment and replied, Personality. He looked at the ground meditatively a few moments, then replied, I don't think they can catch you up on that, and went his way possibly to try his question on someone else. His work sometimes posed questions M.L. was unable to answer. Once he was asked to pray for a teacher who had lived under the Andreasen roof more than once. Now she was laid low by cancer. It seemed clear that here was a case where the Lord could intervene. In the course of his prayer, M.L. said, Father, if you can't see fit to grant our request, we will try to understand, but it won't be easy. They had to try hard, for she did not recover. M.L. sometimes laid, excuse me, M.L. sometimes told 
of an experience that just the telling of it made him sweat a little. It concerned an attractive young Bible instructor and a young man who proved to be more interested in her personally than in the Bible. He was an intelligent, industrious, most eligible fellow who determined that the Bible instructor should be his wife. She assured him she would not marry a person not of her faith. But he persisted. Finally, she said, If Elder Andreasen will perform the ceremony, I will marry you. M.L. was sorely tempted. This was such an ideal young man, and what good judgment he showed in choosing such a fine girl. But he lacked the most important qualification. M.L. knew he must let principal guide, therefore he reluctantly stated that he would have to decline. Instantly the girl said, I knew you would never do it. M.L. never forgot how nearly he had been swept off his feet. Some months before the Milwaukee session of the General Conference in 1926, Andreasen received a formal invitation to present an eight o'clock devotional sermon. He went home all excited. Just think, I've been invited to give a talk at the general conference. Annie waited a moment, then said very, very quietly, Just one? M.L. loved to tell that story. That was just the best thing for me. He would end up. Indeed, it was by no means the only time he would get all blown up about something and Annie would come along and prick his ego, bringing him down to size. He'd come home and say, Well, Mother, what do you think of the sermon today? You had a good text, Father. <laughs> One time at camp meeting, after he preached a sermon, he asked, Mother, what did you think of that? I didn't think it was very good. In the afternoon, he spoke again. At the close, she said, There now, that was better. During his years as Minnesota Conference President, M.L. was asked to prepare Sabbath school lessons on Isaiah for three quarters. He also wrote a commentary that was published each quarter to accompany the lessons. Teenagers of 1928-1929 may remember puzzling over how to pronounce the name Andreasen that appeared on each paper-covered volume of Isaiah the Gospel Prophet. Regardless of how his name might be pronounced, even a youth recognized a scholar. Next chapter. You cannot afford to... You must not permit yourself to be absent this year. I expect to meet you at the Anoka Camp Meeting. The Northern Union Reaper published at Hutchinson carried this greeting a week before M.L. and Annie left Washington Missionary College on their way to Minnesota. For a month, the president-elect had been encouraging the church members to be there. It is not too early to lay plans for coming to camp meeting. Let us have the largest and best meeting we have ever had, he had written. The times demand it. God expects it. All of us need a new spiritual revival. Elder Daniels will take a leading part in the meeting. God has greatly used him the last few years, and we expect great things. The readers of The Reaper were accustomed to seeing weekly articles from the presidents of the various conferences. Each article covered at least a page, usually more. MLs were different. They seldom occupied a column. The little articles constituted personal messages from the pastor as it were, to each member of the, his flock. You are cordially invited to attend June 19 
through 29. The next week carried a last-minute call. By the time you are reading, this camp meeting is just beginning. If you have been unable to come until now, it is better to come late than not at all. So come if you possibly can. During the 1,500-mile trip from Washington to Minnesota, mostly over gravel roads, always through the center of each town and city, ML was thinking about the campsite in the beautiful groves of trees in the southeastern part of Anoka, where the interurban near the interurban line. He could hardly wait until the two hundred family tents should be pitched in rows and the Danish Norwegian tent, the Swedish tent, the various youth and children's tents, and the big pavilion tent itself should all be hauled up around their center poles, then anchored down. The meetings were to begin on Thursday. Wednesday evening, M.L. and the tired group of ministers who had worked so faithfully, getting everything ready, looked over the campground, content. They could have a good night's sleep. There were only the finishing touches to do on the morrow. Then the families would begin to arrive from all over the state. Long before daybreak, heavy drops of rain began to plop down on the canvas over the heads of the sleeping ministers. They awoke with a start. The drops fell thicker. It began to pour. Each man jumped out of bed, pulled on his clothes, and hurried out into the storm to his post. He didn't want anything to befall his area. When all the safeguards had been taken, the drenched men huddled together in the pavilion. The wind was blowing in great gusts now. Suddenly the rain poured down on the men. Lightning flashed. Oh no, moaned one. Did you see that huge tear? wailed another. And its jagged edges? How we'll have to work to get it mended before tomorrow night. It's no use, an older minister sighed. Last summer, we barely could make the thread hold on a small tear. With this big one, the canvas is just too flimsy. With age, then we'll have to rent a tent. And rent one they did and had it up before time for the opening meeting that evening. After reporting the storm in the reaper, ML appealed, Are there not many throughout the conference who have so enjoyed the meetings in the old pavilion that they would like to contribute toward the purchase of a new one? On Sunday morning at camp meeting, $1,725 was given in just a few minutes. M.L. wrote in the Reaper that they really ought to purchase a larger tent in order to accommodate Sabbath visitors. Are there not others who would like to invest something in the new large tent? If so, please send it through the regular channels. While the crowd of church members were still assembled under the rented pavilion, M.L. was contriving a plan to provide for future emergencies. Instead of having to make special appeals, there should be some way for each family to make a regular contribution in proportion to its income. He had it. Why not tithe the tithe? The conference committee agreed. Andreasen wrote, We trust that when you pay your tithe next time, you will not forget the 1% fund. A few weeks later, he inserted a note. Lest we forget, oft times we forget to do the things we really intended to do. Last time I paid my tithe, I came very near forgetting the 1% fund. A few months later, a report could be made of the use of the new fund. This fund will enable us to purchase this year 100 
new three-quarter size folding steel cots with sagless springs for use at camp meeting. Those who have slept or tried to sleep on some of the old double springs that we have had to use at camp meeting time will appreciate these new cots for sure. The 1% fund has made them possible, and there are other needs that w should be supplied from it. So please keep it in mind whenever you pay your tithe. And I think, well, maybe I'll read a little more. Following camp meeting during the 20s was Harvest in Gathering, conducted in the autumn, singing bands, and other such refinements were unheard of. Instead, individual members went out and visited non-Adventist friends and neighbors, asking for contributions for missions. M.L. conducted his own campaign of inspiration through the Reaper. <clears throat> Question. Why should I go harvest in gathering? Answer. One. Funds are provided. Two. The knowledge of this truth is brought to my neighbors. Question. How do I go? Answer. With a consecrated heart. With the renewed fervor of my first love. With prayer. Question. When shall I go? Answer during the six-week campaign at least ten hours because he first loved us. Two weeks later, he wrote, Do your part. Wherever I go, I find our people anxious to get at the work and to finish it in a short time. One year, when in-gathering time came, M.L. took a different approach. When I am out to go bathing, I dread very much walking into the shallow water and getting wet inch by inch. I would far rather dive in head first and have it all over with. Go right to work. Be optimistic, cheerful, and the work will be done. The year of the Wall Street crash, 1929, all optimism failed. As December passed, in gathering was decidedly behind. To fall behind last year's record would be nothing short of a calamity, and yet we are in imminent danger of so doing. I appeal to our workers, to our elders, leaders, people, young and old, to make one more effort. This is an emergency. We must not fail. Let all have a part. One dollar apiece for the whole conference will save the situation. And that's where we will stop, because now it's talking about a different topic. So we'll pick up here next Monday evening at 7 p.m., Lord willing. Let's close with prayer, shall we? We are alive at this time, but along with Sister Spencer, who often talks about being ready for the end of time, that you will help each one of us to be ready for what's ahead. We can't see the future, but we know the general outline and we know the um, end result. So help us to be faithful, to go with you wherever you lead, to surrender our lives to you completely. Be with each one who's been listening tonight. May their lives be strengthened a little more for having been with us this evening, and not because of me, but because of the example of Elder Andreas, and help us to um, continue to study our Bibles, to make it part of our lives, part of our inner being, and may we um, be uh, faithful and true to you and a good witness to everyone we come in contact with, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.